This is Dan Schneider, and on this edition of the Dan Schneider Video Interview, I am doing another in my continuing series of what I'm calling the George Dickerson Project, about the life, the career of the American actor, writer, poet, uh, George Dickerson, who died earlier this year. My guest that you see before is Dayan Georgievich, and he in the film industry, and he will give his memories on George Dickerson. Well, uh, I want to welcome Dayan Georgievich, and uh, uh, Dayan uh, has agreed to give his memories of George Dixon, and he's going to kick it off by reading something they read from uh, George's memorial. But before you do that, Dayan, let me just uh, ask if you could just give a, a minute or two background of who you are, uh, how you met George Dickerson, and what you were involved with him before you do your reading. I'm a, uh, for the last 35 years, uh, I've been a cinematographer, a director. Um, I uh, recently, most recently, actually the last 20 years in television um, uh, episodic shows and uh, movies. Um, and uh, going back to how I met George, uh, we go back to 38 years ago, 1977, when I was a, a graduate student at NYU uh, Film School. And uh, I uh, was preparing for my thesis project, and, uh, which I chose to be a John Cheever story, which was, oh my God, uh, here is the most uh, uh, wonderful uh, American uh, author. And uh, you know, I decided I contacted him, and he uh, gave me permission to um, adapt his story, The Five Forty Eight. And uh, I, it was during the casting that I met George, who recently just came back from Beirut, having served there uh, as a diplomat with the United Nations with UNRWA, and uh, immediately saw this this is the right person to uh, play the lead in my film, uh, which I re renamed called The Commuter. I had non-commercial permission from John Cheever, the author to uh, adapt the, uh, the short story. Um, so it's a friendship that has uh, gone on for, uh, for 38 years, like I said. And uh, with that film, George went on to Los Angeles, and uh, he secured a part on Hill Street uh, Blues. Uh, and of course, so uh, that led up to, uh, of course, Blue Velvet eventually. I think which number of the 20 feature films that he's uh, acted in uh, and of course that led to his being uh, nominated into the Academy of Motion Pictures. Okay. Well, uh, as I said, George died earlier this year in January and uh, I think it was about two months later in March, I believe, was the memorial. And uh, you said that you had, uh, in order to facilitate the interview, you were going to uh, read uh, either part or all of what you had read there. So please go ahead. Okay. Uh, as we say in the film business, and for that matter in life, you only get to know someone after spending a lot of time uh, together in the trenches. I've known George for 38 years. I met him literally not too long after his return to the States, after his surviving the ravages of the Lebanese Civil War, which he confessed scorched whatever was left of his poetic psyche. He was in his early 40s. And just to be able to do something productive and creative, he decided to become an actor. In 1977, I directed him in my award-winning NYU graduate thesis film, The Commuter, adapted from a John Cheever short story, The 548. For the past seven years and up until a few months ago, we've been collaborating, George as writer and me as director, and co-producing his screenplay, The Fool's Errand, based on his real-life experiences during the 1974-75 Lebanese Civil War and his short story first pu published in Penthouse, The Man Who Loved Butterflies. George worked tirelessly under tremendous physical pain and even mental anguish writing numerous rewrites of The Fool's Errand while often under heavy medication. I like to believe writing this screenplay gave him a meaningful purpose and more of a reason to live these past seven years. It was a memorable creative collaboration that made me all the richer having him as my friend. Just like two ex-athletes, which we were many moons ago, we certainly challenged each other and had our disagreements. However, it always ended up bringing out our best. We never took offense, but always worked in pursuit of understanding and reaching for excellence. In other words, we wouldn't allow any room for bullshit or false notes. Ours was a mutual sharing of respect to the currency of ideas combined with a love for truth and beauty. 
It's def very difficult for me to step back today and try to best describe a complex personality that was George. Just as he could be eloquent, charming, and sensitive, he could also, also be a scathingly critical insomniac, difficult, stubborn, grumpy, control freak, micromanager, and a chain-smoking, paranoid beast. And yet, you, would find a more, you wouldn't find a more loyal and dearest friend who spoke and lived his truth, revealing a big heart and love of humanity. He's the man you want on your team and who wasn't afraid to stand up and fight against injustice, unkindness, and all sorts of evil. In some ways, he reminds me of the Byzantine icon of, of St. George slaying the dragon that hangs above my home study desk. A gallant knight errant indeed. This is the same man who stood up and blackmailed the big Lebanese gu gunman, Jemael, to save lives, and it worked. He survived that strange mixture, mixture of everyday life and death, nightmarish in its psychological effects. I believe that fr true friendship is like a lighthouse, a constant beacon of light guiding us safely back to harbor, especially when choppy waters, dark clouds, high winds threaten something much worse. Over the years, we certainly covered each other's back during both in good bad time, and bad times. I think it appropriate to offer parts of a mosaic that pieced together provides an impressionistic portrait of George. One, never attempt to call George whenever there was a Yankee or Giants game going on. You risked his wrath. Two, never schedule a meeting or discuss business on the 13th of the month. Yes, he was superstitious. Three, never totally believe what you read in the newspaper or hear in the news because more often than not, he would say, the opposite of the information is the truer story. Four, best time to have a phone conversation was between the hours of midnight and 3 a.m. George kept vampire hours, thanks to the Lebanese Civil War, when most of the severest fighting occurred at night. Five, his favorite candy bar, Three Musketeers chocolate bar, if you're lucky to still find it. To be enjoyed with a can of Pepsi on a sunny late afternoon in Washington Square Park, preferably a few steps away from Giuseppe Garibaldi's statue. Six, make sure that owner chef Abigail Hitchcock keeps our table free for our late afternoon meetings at Camage Bistro on McDougal Street. George's order was very simple. Black coffee, black coffee, and at least seven. George didn't suffer fools lightly. In fact, he had a photographic memory and would remember exactly to the word what was discussed in conversation. You better be on your best game. I'm not the only one believing that his climbing up all 72 steps to his fifth floor of Bleecker Street apartment extended his life quite a few more years. Allow me to share the following email quote just a few months ago that best illustrates his strong will, determination, and love of life. This past Thursday, I scared all the doctors and nurses by proving I could climb all the 72 steps. I will need to climb to go home to my tenement walk-up apartment. I hope they will unchain this Frankenstein's monster this coming Tuesday, September 23rd, so I can roar out into daylight with my foot and soul intact. And maybe, just maybe, I can whoop it up in the autumn I love so much. George would be a shoo in on the A&E hit reality show, Hoarders. His proclivity for saving every piece of paper turned his apartment to a grand canyon of paper and printed words. George insisted that he knew where everything was stored. In other words, he invented his own Dewey system. Never count George out. His will to live redefined the expression, a cat of nine lives. Hell no, that's not enough. This cool cat made it, made it to 12 lives, skipped the number 13, and he was determined to try for 14 lives. To quote him, he says, I almost died on the 27th. Then with darkness all around me, my wife stuck some mango ice in my mouth for me to suck on. I remember thinking this is too wonderful to leave, and so I fought it out and came back from nowhere. It wasn't uncommon over the past five years that George would suddenly take a beat and spin off topic with a desultory remark. He would look to me uh, and say, you must know I don't have much more time left. To which I would acknowledge saying, yeah, yeah, George, I understand. Some of us just have more of a head start, that's all. Of course, I understood the other import of his statement, get the fool's errand script produced already. George was adamant about not using the four-letter word beginning with F in the fool's errand screenplay. He did his best to avoid using what 
he did his best to avoid using what for some of us is normal quotidian expression. Fuck you. He believed it was too easy, lazy, and sloppy use of language to define one's character. He wrote The Fool's Errand screenplay while listening and being inspired to the soundtrack of The English Patient, composed by the brilliant and talented French-Lebanese Oscar award-winning composer Gabriel Yerry. One of the last emails that George shared with me was a comment he made to a L.A. film producer via email saying, I'm still in a hospital dreaming of lighthouses, like lonely outposts beckoning into the mist of the future. Know, dear friend, that you've reached a safe port of call surrounded by those who love you, Suzanne, Aaron, Dome, Sam, Lisa, and Rachel. You have a remarkable, beautiful family as well, as uh, outstanding friend, ho friends holding ship's anchor with you. One of the last emails I received from George was, Dear Dayon, thanks for having been my friend. I wrote back, your friend yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Thank you, my dear friend. Well, thanks for uh, sharing that, that Dayon. Um, I, was just, I was just thinking the last time I actually spoke with George, probably about 11 months ago, I think it was in August, uh, I had been off two or three times a year for about a dozen years since about 03 or 02 uh, when he first contacted me because I had written uh, an article about, well, no, he had contacted me about my website, uh, early uh, internet radio show. But um, so uh, just uh, let me start off. Tell me about uh, the last time that you saw George. Was it within the last month or two of his life? Because I remember his voice was quite weak. And I remember, I remember now saying to my wife back even uh, last August, I think that's probably going to be the last time I'm going to speak to George. I saw, I saw George uh, the night before he passed away uh, in uh, uh, hospice. He was at uh, Bellevue in the hospice uh, uh, ward. And um, it's, it was very surreal for me because, um, uh, just as a side note, I was experiencing my grandson's cancer, a fight for cancer. He's, only two, he's just turned two years old. He's a twin. And he was on the ninth floor and George was on the 17th floor. Uh, so uh, I was visiting George quite regularly during the uh, last year, especially uh, when he was in uh, either uh, an assisted living uh, facility or at the hospital. Um, let me uh, just uh, talk a bit about uh, the screenplay, The Fool's Errand. I remember I read it in 2009, he, uh, George had uh, sent me uh, yeah. it, and I know it was constantly being revised, so it probably went through... Uh, maybe three or four more revisions over the years before whatever it is now or his, his last final version. Uh, when I spoke with Richard Hobby, who's been trying to get a produce for a number of years, uh, he had told me that uh, he had so had other uh, contacts uh, that's five or ten years about the screenplay and so, so, some anecdotes about trying to get a producer. I know George was adamant to not get the money people of Hollywood involved because they would, uh, you know, uh, inevitably try to Hollywood ending it up kind of thing. So uh, uh, just speak a little bit if you have one or two anecdotes about trying to get the film made. Well, as a matter of fact, just on the last point there, uh, we, uh, George uh, was had me connect with a uh, Hollywood producer that he worked with 15 years ago, Jeffrey Clifford, who's president of Heyman Films. They're best noted for their Harry Potter series. And um, Jeffrey Clipper is a big fan of George's work. Uh, and, uh, and he's still currently in the position trying to help me uh, get to A-list actors, because we realize we need a, a prominent actor who's going to be in every scene to get this, uh, this uh, screenplay realized. Now, through Rick, R Richard Hobby uh, and his connections, um, we... Uh, we're in contact with uh, Ramez Tome from Sherazad Films, and they produced over 12 feature films, uh, including Woody Harrelson's The Messenger and a few other of his films. Uh, we are now listed uh, in development with Sherazad Films, uh, projected for 2017. But the, but it's a, it's been a lot of uh, it's a balancing act because uh, what Sherazad can produce is eventually a good part of the financing, but it's all contingent on getting that A-list actor. And to get, so that's where Jeffrey Clifford comes in to try, to try and he's going to be, he's our conduit uh, 
person to help us get to that A-list actor through these agents in LA. And I got to tell you, it's an exhausting process, you know, because uh, a lot of people, it just takes time. I think an anecdote that Jeffrey said, said, listen, for anyone to read a script in this town, it takes at least three months or more uh, before you get, get, so it's, a, it's, now prior to this, yes, we had some close calls with some independent vet investors in um, Michigan. Actually, we're uh, of Lebanese-American descent who uh, like the script, uh, at least their, their uh, representative loved the script very much, and uh, they, in my, uh, what I was told, uh, and through, well, actually, they own a lot of the real estate, and corporate real estate in that, in that, um, in that area. Uh, but you know that that took a, that took a, about two years away from our efforts because it was back and forth, back and forth, a lot of smoke and mirrors, and eventually uh, they had put money in a, in a film um, that uh, I'm trying to remember uh, didn't do well, and so then eventually they backed off from wanting to invest in any other films. Uh, so right now in the in the current situation, uh, I've. Um, Looking at a scenario where we've got to get the a, a, a prominent actor that will kick in uh, the uh, the work of uh, the support of uh, Sherazad. In the meantime, I've uh, worked out a very uh, uh, a, a shooting schedule, the budget that incorporates uh, shooting in Cyprus and also in Serbia. Uh, I'm also aware that Serbia we would look into a combination of equity monies from Sherazad and tax credits from Serbia, as well as um, pre-sales that, that, that's dependent on who our lead actor is. That's the reality. Yeah. So in, in some ways, yeah, we go back to, is it a Hollywood, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a hybrid. It's, it's, you you got to have the name to, to, to kick the project off, you know, unless, um, you know, I, ha I go a route that I admire and envy my European uh, colleagues uh, who work within the uh, film fund in Europe. Um, where we would get a less known actor, perhaps, as the lead, and we could do it for a lot cheaper. Uh, so that's 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 in a, in a nutshell where we are at this point. But George and I created Jugglers Junction as co-producers of this. Richard Hobby is part when is in contract with us uh, as as part of our team, and. Um, it's just a, it's a long distance run. What can I say? The old adage is it's like giving birth to an elephant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he said that uh, uh, George always wanted you to direct the film. Um, uh, so just... Um, is it any easier, do you think? I mean, if there was someone like a Dino De Laurentiis still alive, I think he died some, some years back, would it be easier to get some, someone like him than a Hollywood person? And on the Hollywood side, I mean, if how much, you know, just explain a little bit about the mechanics of, let's say you got a George Clooney or a, a Brad Pitt kind of attached to a project. So the European, you know, if you could explain that for like a layman. Well, let me, uh, let me the, the, the emphasis right now is going after our lead person. And uh, of course, when I speak to folks in Hollywood, oh, let's talk, talk to Bradley Cooper, let's talk to Christian Bale, let's talk to Jake Gyllenhaal, but he's a little young. But uh, what George and I, well, I always had Viggo Mortensen as, our, as the lead uh, uh, person for this. Even though he's well into his 50s right now, I still feel he can play a little younger because ideally the character of Eric Johnson is in his, in his early 40s. Um, so, uh, and of course, let me just get uh, as far as preliminary cast suggestions here. I was thinking of Paul Giamatti, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman is past. He would have made a perfect Jack, I thought. Uh, but I thought, I think, I believe in strong that Paul Giamatti would uh, fulfill that role quite well. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it's uh, as far as a European producer, right? It's um, that's a possibility, or it's it's a producer that I'm seeking uh, through Sherazad and through some other connections that we can work this out through Europe, which is why I chose Europe. I had filmed in, in, in when Serbia was Yugoslavia, part of Yugoslavia back in in the late '80s. I'm um, also good friends with their two leading directors there, uh, Gordon Paskalovic and Amir Kasturica. Um, so I'm well aware of the cost advantages uh, of, of shooting in uh, Eastern Europe. And they're both, actually, those countries are competing with each other with tax credits as we speak. Um, and I filmed, uh, it's been a privilege as a cinematographer, director, I've filmed around the world many, many times. And uh, had the opportunity to work with, with uh, different producers and crews there. 
So, I mean, it's an ongoing process. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as where that, the final chemistry is going to come together, um, that's still what we're working on right now. I think the priority is getting that lead person, a, a lead commitment. And with that, I'm, 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 I'm in meetings now with the casting director, uh, and we're going through that. It just takes time. And so patience is, is, is emphasized here uh, to get a response. For Unfortunately, the A actors I've worked with, which quite a few, like Richard Dreyfuss or... Um, um, uh, anyway, Dreyfus comes, comes to mind right now. Stanley Tucci is another. Uh, they, they they aren't the right characters for this part, uh, for this for this story. Um, and it is a an industry of relationships, uh, and that's why uh, we have have good uh, feed, uh, feedback and communication. I met with Jeffrey Clifford at Warner's lot last January. We had a very productive meeting. Uh, and it's basically he's making he's making every effort to get in touch with the leading agencies to get the script to these A-list actors, and that's the something that was a common th uh, theme with George and myself. And when I would be on the phone with him, he'd say, "Get the script to the, get to these actors. We got to get the script to these actors." So that's 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 the priority right now. Uh, speaking of relationships, has uh, George's son Dome Kar Karakowski, who's a, a well-known Finnish filmmaker, has he been uh, involved in anything? Has he given you any tips or leads of uh, people, money people, or people in Europe to, to help get the production going? Uh, it's funny you should mention Dome. I've had uh, we, we've uh, struck up a friendship uh, last year. Uh, I'm also a professor at the School of Visual Arts. I teach a master's class in cinematography, and um, the. Uh, School of Visual Arts wanted me to vet two conservatories in Europe last year, and one was in Finland. And so that brought me together with Dome, although I had met him briefly here when he came to visit George a year before. But uh, we, uh, we, str we struck up a very good friendship, and, uh, and also I saw him this past February in Los Angeles because he's, he's preparing a new movie. Um, as it really, no, we, we, I didn't really talk about, uh, you know, the European method or what he can provide, although he was very supportive of me to direct the film. I feel it's a, it's a project that has to be made. But uh, he, I, I just, he's in a different uh, situation. I mean, he's now risen to be one of the top directors out of Finland. And, and what again, I go back to what I said earlier, is that I envy my European director friends or filmmakers. They work on the film fund. They can make films for three to five million dollars. Uh, they work it out by getting cr credits. If they shoot in Ireland, they'll get a little bit from Ireland. If they do the post in Germany, they'll get a little money from Germany. And if they do uh, uh, sound, uh, some other sound design in France, they'll get some money. That's the way they work. I know Goran, my, uh, my Serbian uh, director friend, uh, he's made 16 feature films that way successfully. Uh, so that's, that's, you know, again, I admire that. It's an equation to, to, to look at uh, if we were to go with the European route. But I'm not... Um, I, I, you know, I am a, I'm an American, and uh, the question is, you know, we, we, we don't have an entity that's a European entity. To how to work that out, to, to, to work that equation, that's a possibility. Um, but right now, I have, if you look at the Sherazad um, management um, with Ramez, you can look at, uh, as recently as a couple months ago, he asked me for a byline for the uh, poster. And we have the Fool's Aaron now that there's a poster, and there's also a byline on it. Uh, listed as Sherazad, one of their five or ten, six films in development right now. Okay, well, let's end this segment uh, with uh, talking about the film, and uh, let's take a little break. And in the next segment, we'll back to the beginning, uh, you know, your post uh, uh, agenda, you know, anything else that you've done with George over the years, and we'll do that in a moment. I want to now uh, get... Uh, or take a little step back and talk about with George on, on both a personal uh, level as well as if you ever worked together with him. So you had mentioned that uh, back in the 70s you uh, uh, had graduated, done uh, a film oh. adaptation uh, with George acting in it? Yes. And uh, so uh, was that the, the just the first of uh, several collaborations? Or? Well, that was, a, that was the first uh, collaboration uh, that... Uh, uh, you know, I cast him uh, for that role in the, the 548 adaptation, John Cheever. And uh, what I what I found there was this there was a scene there at the end of the short story where let me back up is the the, the char lead character is, is a cad. He's a womanizer, and uh, he 
his character uh, has a, a has the uh, uh, has this woman fired because after a one night stand, and uh, she pursues him through the streets of New York, and ultimately it it it, uh, it resolves in a scene underneath the train tunnel between the North and South South trains, and. Uh, she confronts him with, a, she chases him through, she meets him at the, let me back up, she, she chases him through the streets of New York, leading on to the, he, he, he thinks he successfully uh, eluded, eluded her, and uh, she ends up on the train with him, and he wants to leave, and then she throws, she puts a, a 38 to his ribs. Uh, George's performance in that last scene was stunning. And um, right then, I, I, I saw where the emotional memory, where the references came from, uh, given the horrors that he experienced in, in Beirut. Um, the, she has him at, at gunpoint, and then, of course, the story ends that she feels a lot better. Uh, it's, morally, she feels that it would be a waste to, to shoot him. Uh, she's a lot better than that. And as she leaves slowly through this underground tunnel to go to the southbound trains, George's character gets up and, lay, and uh, emits a primal scream, shouting out her name. It was so riveting. Uh, and again, I just, to myself, I, you know, I, I understood it, didn't want to disturb him, I, where this was all coming from, but it certainly echoed many of the horrors and, and day of, uh, his last days of uh, PTS, uh, post-traumatic uh, stress uh, disorder. Um, but uh, yeah, that was one, that was the first, and then it involved that we both had an interest in, in international relations. Uh, I was a double major in college of Russian studies and international relations. It wasn't until my senior year I decided to uh, go and to, to, con to uh, commit to filmmaking uh, rather than going uh, the route of diplomacy. Uh, uh, so we had that we had that uh, common bond about being very um, interested in international politics, what's going on in the world. Uh, also, we were fa big fans of Jean Luc Carre, Graham Greene, uh, and uh, we shared uh, our appreciation, you know, for for that genre of stories. And um, you know, when it came to the, uh, the a few years ago, exactly seven years ago, I approached George again, and I said, you know. That story, um, the man who loved butterflies, has stayed with me for 20 years now. I really believe it could be expanded into a, 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 a powerful film. Uh, he was reluctant at first. We would meet. He said, "Well, let's talk about it." We met at the Cafe Vivaldi a few times for a few about li literally three months. And he, and, he, and he said, "Take some notes." He said, "Dan, you got to understand. This is very painful for me to draw up a lot many of these experiences from my life. Uh, what happened in, uh, when I was at, in Beirut at, in '74, '75." Uh, eventually, yeah, he said, you know, okay, because I've been thinking about, I just started writing my novel about this based on a man, uh, a man who loved butterflies, but let's go ahead and let's do it. It's not going to be easy. So the, <laughs> it, the first three months, he was, ama he was amazing. First three months, every night at midnight, I would get a phone call with one scene written already, and I would give my notes. And after the, the first draft, believe it or not, I could see the, where the influence of the novel came through here was it was 200 pages. <laughs> I said, George, we've got to trim this. We've got to take this down. And eventually after, so my role was, is, was taking what uh, was a short story, uh, Man Love Butterflies, which is now about nine pages in Act 3 of, of uh, The Fool's Errand. Uh, and, 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 and again, go through this, this editing and uh, criticism process, which was back and forth that went on for uh, up until recently, where I changed, we changed the ending. Uh, I, I felt the ending was uh, a bit uh, manip uh, manipulative and contrived. I felt it was greater honesty to have uh, his son and, and Eric Johnson part in Beirut with the idea that who's going to step up first and say, you're my son or you're my father. Um, and uh, I, it's a different ending right now, which I think is far stronger, more honest. And I think it, uh, it uh, underscores uh, the, Eric Johnson's character of seeking redemption through love with his family by returning to his family. 
Um, I was going to ask actually about uh, whether you and George uh, ever exchange notes about uh, writing or film. Let me uh, start on, on the George end because I know that uh, he had a two decade or so writer's block, especially right. with poetry. Uh, did he ever talk to you about that? Did he ever send you any poems or anything other than the screenplay or the novel to look no, I've, I've, of course, I've, I've read his poems, uh, and he didn't send me any new poems. The, the writer's block that uh, that he had for quite a few years following his uh, time in Beirut. Um, uh, I just wanted to share with you, with there's something here. Uh, he said, please understand, uh, it says here, I look... I look forward to being able to work with you in the future and will be interested in your reaction to my Butterfly short story. This is after we first met. Please understand it was written in 1984 and as the first thing I was able to write after the war. It was an emotional outlet for not only my kidnapping, but also the horrors I experienced during the war, especially the deaths of Malad and the Dane. At the time of the story's writing, I was still trying desperately to rescue myself from myself, trying to understand the darkness in me that the war had unleashed and how to live with that. I really cared about that boy. He was sweet and charming until the war, and as all civil wars are capable of doing, hardened him into an angry killer roaming the streets of Damour with political leaflets and a Kalishnikov. As my caddy always made me laugh, especially at myself and my foibles on the golf course. He was so proud that his name meant Christmas. Uh, he says, I'm forever haunted as if somehow I was unable to save him. The Dane, whom I only knew during the one phase ways, his philosophy has helped me to survive. I thought I'd share that with you. I was just gleaning this morning because I, I have hundreds of emails between, in dialogue between the two of us, uh, you know, sharing notes, and it was all part of the creative process that came into the... Uh, creation of Eric Johnson's character, which uh, to George's admission was 75% of it's true or 80% of it's uh, based on his own personal, uh, true life experiences in Beirut at the time. Um, I, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I had mentioned uh, uh, in another interview uh, how George had told me of an anecdote that he had when he guest starred on a TV show, I believe in the 80s with Lorne Green, when he uh, had spent like a weekend worrying about... Uh, a scene that he had to to shoot, and uh, when he got on the set that morning, uh, he he wanted to bring up that he thought the scene was was not filmable for whatever reason, and he was sitting, I guess, in the makeup chair with Lorne Green, famous from Bonanza and uh, Battlestar Galactica, uh, and then Green uh, turned to him and said, "So, George, how are we going to do this scene?" And George, George felt like relief that uh, uh, he wasn't the only one that thought that the scene sucked, and so. Uh, they got their heads together, they rewrote the scene, and whoever the director of that episode of that show was, uh, you know, after they had done it, uh, right. they said, uh, you know, I hope you didn't mind, we rewrote it. The guy was like, no, we don't, we don't mind. I didn't even notice and whatnot. Um, I was wondering, uh, did George ever uh, relate those kind of, any anecdotes like that? Or, you know, was, uh, if you could say, if that's sort of typical of George's uh, uh working relationship with other people that you might have known of? He was, uh, as, again, it goes back to when we first met when I did the uh, uh, the 548. I mean, we just, uh, the, the, the intelligence uh, and, and, the, and the specificity that we had in our dialogue and discussion of character was always, uh, uh, was always uh, top on the list in, in, our, in our conversations. Um, uh, you know, George uh, was very much, uh, feel, and I agree 100%, is that you've got to be conflict in the scene, or else you have no scene. And that, that bears back to the anecdote you're mentioning, where the director says, I'm glad you guys figured it out, because it just the scene was just flat. There's just nothing, there's no, there's no arc in the scene, you know. And uh, George, uh, you know, felt that, and, and we were very careful in, in, in when he was writing the screenplay, that there was some, some conflict in a particular scene where, you know, one or the other character wants something, and what's preventing that character from getting it, to put it in simple terms. Uh, so, uh, and I've had George come over to my uh, class, my master's class, and uh, he's given um, presentations 
Uh, actually, this is funny. Here's an anecdote for you. When, uh, he says, Dan, I'm, I'll be more than happy to, to speak to your master's class, uh, but let me do it and you'll see what's going to happen. Well, he appears as a homeless man in a tattered raincoat. And he walks in, and the students are saying, well, well, he, as I'm speaking, I'm interrupted by this homeless-looking man, you know, with a tattered raincoat. And he's asking, is this where the polling booth is? Because it was in November, by the way. <laughs> and the kids say, no, 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 it's not the, that's not the polling booth. He says, oh, yes, it is the polling booth. Of course it is. I know this. I was told this is the right address. Meanwhile, some of, the, some of the students are, you know, are getting quite disturbed, saying, what's going on here? And then George proceeds to go in the corner as if he's going to pull uh, his pants and take a leak in the corner. And one student runs out to get security. And with that, George takes off his tattered raincoat and says, it's all illusion. <laughs> it's all make-believe. <laughs> and what's truth? And so that kicked off uh, the, uh, the lecture about you know, truth and uh, finding the, you know, the conflict in scenes. But uh, I'll never forget that. And he's repeated that performance at least two or three times in subsequent uh, classes. Did, uh, did you ever find anything uh, on any shoots that you did... Uh uh, that uh, I, I don't know what p particular problems you might have had, but that uh, uh, George may have helped suggest something for you uh, in, in any way? Um, yeah, it goes back to, um, there was a scene, um, you know, was, again, again, film is a collaborative process, so uh, whoever gets the credit. I remember a scene with Stanley Tucci when I was doing a show called Three Pounds. It was a short-lived but a show about a neurosurgeon, and Tucci saying, "I don't want to sit behind the desk here." And they got a six, five-page scene here uh, where this lawyer is threatening to sue me, and uh, he's he's demanding that I not operate on his sister. I don't have his permission. And um, it, and I recall, you know, with the director, I was saying, "Well, yeah, it seems." And then Tucci came up with it it's together. It, it was a suggestion. I. What's the best way I could rebuff this character? And I need a physical act. I don't want to sit behind the desk, which makes the scene very static. Instead, I'll have my assistant, who's present in this art, in this in this exchange. His his assistant neurosurgeon was there. And while while this while this lawyer is venting, I'm going to walk away from my desk and go to the book uh, bookshelf. In other words, I'm going to take an action. And that's in the film is one of the primary. Um, uh, ex good examples of uh, you know it's it's not through just words it's also through a character's actions that we can reveal character and personality and motivations and um, just with that act that Tucci decided to turn his back and go to the bookshelf is, su is subtle but yet poignant emphasis on this person's disrespecting my space so therefore I'm turning my back my assistant can talk to him and then after this person this lawyer has finished venting. He's going to turn around and, say, and then Tucci says, are you finished? But I recall that, and, and my suggestion was that there needed to be a physical activity. And I recall that in our conversations years ago when I was doing the, uh, the 548, was, uh, you know, coming up with a visual grammar, coming up with giving an act or an action, a verb to work off. And that, that was very much an emphatic point that George, uh, uh, we, in our conversations with another, as far as, you know, what helps him as an actor is, is coming up with an action. And, but again, step back, there's got to be a conflict, but then how am I going to express it through my action as well as the words? Now, uh, I, I never met George personally, but uh, I, as I mentioned, I had about uh, 12 years of contact with him via email and probably two to three times a year uh, via telephone conversation between one and two hours. So I probably had about 50 hours worth of conversations with him over the years. And uh, I'm, I've am i been trying, as I've been uh, doing uh, the last uh, couple of months, these interviews, trying to remember uh, anecdotes myself. And I do remember that there was one thing that George always refused to talk about, and it was on the professional side, uh, and it was... as I had mentioned before the interview, George had done a couple of uh, what I would call sequelitis films, Psycho 2, I believe he was in, and also right. Death Wish 4, which I would assume he w w also had Charles Bronson in it. And I think it was Psycho 2, not Death Wish 4, but it, I could have it wrong. Maybe you know that George said there was 
it was the worst ex acting experience of his life, but he didn't want to go into it because I don't know whether it was because he felt ashamed or felt belittled or he didn't want to uh, leave a black mark on his name. But now that now that he's no longer with us, I was wondering if, if he had ever related to you what the, which film it was, why it, it, it was such a, a horrible experience for him. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to uh, dust out the uh, the attic here in my mind to recall that anecdote. Um, I remember it was on the dock uh, in Santa Monica. He played a detective, um, and he was, was uh, they were, they were arresting two? arresting a fellow. Was it Psycho Two? Yeah, it could have been Psycho Two, but I, I exactly what the point there. Um, just I'm trying to I'm trying to recall, but it ha I think it had to do more with. It was just an expression, one word, one couple lines, rather than a full paragraph, and, and that was more expository, as opposed to just saying something that subtextually. And that's that's another key thing that Georgia all emphasized was it's what's it's between the lines. It's not always what's on the on, on the surface. It's the subtext. And I think in that I don't. And I wish I could remember exactly what the line was for that uh, that scene. But it was an emphasis about subtext, and it took only but a few words and an expression in the eyes to get the point across. And speaking of eyes, you know, I'll never forget from my film school. I had Nicholas Ray when he uh, would come in uh, and talk to us, and uh, he always said one thing that always stayed with me. And it reminds me of the Greek adage, you know, the mirrors of uh, the, the eyes and the mirrors of the soul. And he said. Uh, it's, uh, cinema is the melody is in the, is in the eyes. That's what Nicholas said. The melody is in the eyes. I'll never forget that. And even as a cinematographer and director, we communicate so much at times that it's, it's not many words, but it could be just an expression, a look, you know, that reveals something that's internal. Uh, you mentioned uh, George uh, in his film acting. I know that George had mentioned that I think he had written a few one-act plays, and I, I know he did stage uh, in the 80s uh, and the 90s as well. Did you ever get a chance to see him on stage, and can you talk maybe perhaps if you did uh, any differences in terms of George as a stage dramatic actor and in the film television work? I saw his one man uh, play years ago, about 30 years, 25 years ago here in New York. And what, and what was the name of that? Do you um, I can't recall. It's in his, it's, it's in his book. Uh, the, uh, it, it was a one man show. Um, I think it's in his book uh, in the back. Uh, I'll have to go back to it. I, uh, okay. but, uh, but anyway, um, George was not a, George was not a method actor. Yeah. I mean, George is more akin to the, the British school of acting. Uh, you know, it was, uh, I remember, forget, I don't care how you feel, it's more important how the audience feels. Yeah, I remember him saying that on, on more than one occasion, yeah. And uh, so, uh, you know, it, uh, he was not, yeah, he was definitely not a method uh, person and had a little patience for it, but uh, uh, he was... Uh, yeah, that was that. That was the uh, that was the emphasis he would always say. You know, it's it's, it's not. I don't care what I feel. It's what the audience is going to going to feel in in that moment uh, on stage. Um, yeah, I can think. He, I can see he was a thinking man's uh, thinking man's actor. You, you could just feel the gears uh, working. Uh, um, not to say it it, it 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 reduced or minimized the the feeling of spontaneity. Not at all. No. It's just that he had a totally different approach. Um, it was more, it was more cerebral. Um, it was very, very, he had very, very clear technical preparation uh, in, in, in his um, in his work. Uh, uh, and uh, but you know the, what I saw on stage was again it it, it drew on the memories of his his his, his experiences uh, during in, in the war and, and prior to that and his different relationships. Do you remember, because now that you mentioned the method acting thing, I remember George, this is maybe close to a decade ago, uh, telling me an anecdote. On one of the films, he was working with a Hollywood actor who was a well-known method actor. I, I remember George was saying uh, uh, he was he was just sort of glad that he didn't share that many scenes with him, uh, that it was a younger fellow at the time. Uh, uh, and uh, George was sort of just... He, 
discuss it with a kind of uh, prima donna like thing. Uh, do you remember? Uh, did he ever mention that? Uh, I'm trying to think of which film it might have been. Uh, it wasn't Nicolas Cage. Um, uh, was oh, I'm trying to think uh, who he might have been with because I remember. I remember he had an anecdote where George went off and was exasperated about just how <laughs> how how the the director bent over backwards for the the thing and how he had George and and the other actors had to sit around for three or four hours until this person got in the mood. And I know it was male, but I can't remember for the life of me yeah. what film or what actor. I was just wondering if you recall. I, I don't recall it, but I, you know, as a director, I, I I can share the frustration. And but it has to start with uh, we both agree that that the the, the most important aspects in, in 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 determining a successful film are the script and casting, and especially in casting, you may have a, a, a singularly wonderful actor, but you you have to make sure that the chemistry is going to work. You know, one person. I mean, each every actor has their own process. Process. But you, you, you hope that, um, let's say, if it's a uh, Pacino or someone uh, who is going to get it all in, th in three takes, but the other actor that you cast, he needs 17 takes. You know, how do you now? I mean, do you do you go ahead and cast them, or, or, or in more in more cases than that, you may. But then you have to determine, you know, how are you going to prime them, <laughs> like two thoroughbreds at the gate. You know, one one's, one's good in three takes, and the other's uh, good in seventeen. So, 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 so. That's that's a struggle. That's a bad. Um, yeah. But, uh, um, let me just mention something real quickly uh, about uh, a note he made here. He said, John Le Carre devoted himself to describing betrayal, its terrible consequences, its relationship to love, and how the greater the love, the greater betrayal. If it was a test, we both failed, even though I knew all the answers beforehand. And then there is, of course, D. Libenschluge, the great lie we have to tell ourselves in order to be able to go on living with ourselves. The little lies are like body lice. Once you sense them on the other person, you can never really trust they've been gotten rid of forever. I truly hate the lies that are bullshit, a residue of my auto de fe in Beirut. Bullshit brings compromise that degrades the soul. There is no bullshit in my script. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I was just looking up on uh, IMDb, and I remember the actor, because I looked it up, it was After Dark, My Sweet, and Jason That's Patrick right. was the actor that, uh, right. that uh, right. was the prima donna that he was mentioning. And no, no offense, please don't sue me, Jason Patrick, but, uh, that I, 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 but I'm trying to remember what the, the anecdote was. But anyway, um, let me ask you this. Uh, about the uh, actor versus a writer, because uh, I only saw George in, uh, let's see, uh, The Blue Velvet, the After Dark, My Sweet, uh, Psycho 2, and I think I might have seen Death Wish 4. I never really watched Hill Street Blues. Um, mm -hmm. And th they, they were minor roles that weren't, you know, uh, I don't think really uh, showcased the uh, uh, his acting ability so much, but I have read uh, his stories, his poems, um, uh, and uh, the the screenplay. And I'm wondering, uh, uh, do you think that uh, George was uh, a more had a more natural bent as a writer because uh, he had started out before he went into diplomacy, uh, you know, as an editor at uh, what was the 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 uh, magazine in the '60s that uh, was sort of like a a uh, playboy, um, what was it, uh, Cavalier. Yeah, um, Cavalier. Yeah, uh, because I th I think that, and I, I, I remember he did send me one of his plays, and I think George, had he uh, not had the writer's block, I think he could have really been a playwright. I think that was his natural metier. I think he had a good uh, sense of character, a good sense of uh, people, and a, and a good a dramatic sense. Uh, what, what is your take on him as a writer versus an actor? Oh, I think, I think George is a brilliant writer. I, I, uh, do you read Chico? His early uh, yeah, short yeah. story? Yeah, yeah. Fact, I mean, fact, that it's, on, it's on my website. Yeah, that and the man who, uh, the man with butterflies right. is on Ch my website. Chico, for me, pre-staged the uh, cuckoo's nest <laughs> in many ways uh, because it came out of that era of the 50s and early 60s. Actually, fifties, um, and it's based on his experiences when he was uh, hospitalized when he was in the army, uh, uh, just after the Korean War, I believe, or during that time. Um, uh, yes, I, I again, you know, his his uh, collection of short stories and his his, his, his marvelous, fantastic as as a poet. Uh, I think when I was directing him, I remember my thesis film. 
it, it was a challenge for me talking about keeping to uh, a, a balance on the set where he would step out of character and we go into analysis about his character. And so I, I thought that was the writer in him that was uh, stepping out of his, his character. And uh, we would discuss, you know, the, the phrase, how it was written or the structure, etc. You know, so I think it was, it, I'm sure it was, a, it was a conflict in him somewhat, you know, to uh, to leave that aside and, and immerse yourself into the, into the character because he was so... Uh, like a great chess player, he was always 15 steps ahead, and also very knowledgeable about what echoes in this in the scene that's on hand to what happened before and what's going to happen later on in the storytelling. So he was a, he was a brilliant and a natural storyteller. Uh, so, and his years of experience as an editor at Time um, and uh, as a story a story a short story writer poet, uh, wonderful and. And then the acting came, well, if you listen, you've heard, you've heard him, of course, uh, recite his poetry. It's spellbinding. You know, he's just, just it's beautiful. Uh, yeah, I've, so actually, I've actually done some po poem videos uh, from, with, with his wife, Suzanne. I've got his uh, CD actually uh, in front of me here, the CD uh, that you can see. That, that, with yes, the I, I, have, I have and it so as well. Got, he's got 30-some poems so over the next year or two. Uh, every few weeks, I'm going to be doing little poem videos to get his stuff out. His wife, uh, Suzanne, his widow, uh, gave me permission to do that. But yeah, but you know, George had a, uh, had a one hell of a sense of humor too. It was the black humor. I got to be frank with you. We would meet uh, even when he could barely walk down those 72 steps, and we would meet at the cafe. Come up, we have our table there. And oh, you know, I don't have much time left. <laughs> you know, and that would that would that would that would that would start off the conversation. But it, but it was in it was in jest, and uh, it, but same time it was a reality, and we accepted his reality. Uh, but he did have a biting uh, humor, and uh, yeah, it. Uh, and again, but same time, I must say, what a big heart. A lot of humanity. I mean, just uh, just a warm of heart. Uh, apart from the fact that he could be so biting, and you had to watch you uh, cross your t's and dot your eyes. He was very, very meticulous. Uh, I would say, even in my conversation, as close as we were, we're very close friends. I, I see my. I was probably one of his closest friends. Uh, was that uh, he would remember exactly what you had said a year ago. And, and call call back to the T to the sentence. So yeah, I always found sometimes I had to catch myself. Said, hmm. "It's like right now our sessions." He he, he was recording it, and uh, you had to really be careful. You know, be clear about what you were saying, and it led to disagreements and arguments we would have because he would misinterpret what I said. But. Uh, um, uh, a brilliant, uh, complex, uh, wonderful, uh, dear friend, which who I, I miss. Yeah, I remember uh, many times calling him, and uh, and I too, I would call him uh, no later than eleven o'clock Central Time. I'm in Texas, which would be midnight uh, uh, New York time, and he'd pick up like you know he he he'd, he'd be real energetic. I says, "How are you doing, George?" And he'd be. Uh, Oh, you know, my leg hurts, and he'd go on for twenty minutes or something. <laughs> but then, 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 I, then I, then I talk about you know some movie. Or a lot of times, at least once a year, when he was doing uh, the Motion Picture Academy uh, stuff and getting all the DVD stuff, uh, you know, those would be some of the longest conversations that would go on two or three hours, and he'd talk about this, that, and that always seemed to energize him. Um, yeah. So, so let me uh, let's. Uh, if you have uh, any other final thought, let's just wrap up this conversation. Or if you just want to uh, add a final comment, and as I've said with some of uh, George's other people, if you ever do get any other uh, uh, anecdotes, we can always do a follow-up interview. Or as sure. the as the film screenplay progresses, you know, if a year from now you got the green light, and we right. can talk about that. Um, uh, is there any uh, final thing, at least for this interview, that you'd like to add about the life and times of George Dickerson as you knew him? Well, can I, before I answer that, uh, yeah. let me give you one more uh, little bit here. Okay, uh, go ahead. That I thought was, uh, this was when we were getting criticism from writers about the first act being too long or the script being too long, etc. 
And George's response uh, was, maybe we should stop, just stop listening to what bothers people, including ourselves, and instead listen to all those who say it's a wonderful script. Maybe they don't realize that what bothers may be essential to what makes it seem wonderful in the long run. Tonight I was sitting here thinking about the first act again, because you're still bothered by it, mentioning me, because I felt it was still a little long, and I thought about Michelangelo's sculpture of David. I have sat and studied that David in that church in Florence for 45 minutes at a time, pondering it from every angle. The bent right leg is much longer than the straight left leg, yet it gives the illusion of absolute proportionality. It only works because one leg is much longer than the other. And maybe my script is something uh, absurdly uh, magical like that. <laughs> maybe the first act just needs to be too long. <laughs> Well, that, that's the way. That's the way it is with art too. Um, there, there's always. Uh, uh, I, I've often said, and I, I remember saying this to George, that there's a difference. And it's speaking usually of poetry, there's a difference between a perfect poem and a great poem. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I've written poems uh, that I know that technically were great or uh, were perfect or whatnot, but there wasn't any higher element that it, it, it was, it was, it was what it was and it, it had great music this way, but a great poem might have a flaw, but it reaches out at something. It, it reaches into you. And I think George understood the difference between perfection and greatness and why greatness as imperfect as it might be at times is in my opinion. And I know George shared this opinion is the better thing. It's the higher thing. And it's the thing that people will look toward. They're not going to, people are often scared of perfection, but people are sort of, I, I, I think, uh, drawn to greatness. Uh, people want to be great at something, whether it's just, you know, taking kids, being a good human being, whereas perfection scares them off. And I, I know George shared that opinion. I, I, and I add to that is that uh, even as a cinematographer and director, uh, I'm looking for, the, what's the idea, mood, and emotion of each scene? And I think, uh, I think it was uh, Levinson once said, is if the audience can remember one or two key scenes that affected them emotionally, yeah. Yeah. then you're, you'll, you'll be forgiven for the rest of the other scenes that are not up to snuff, so to speak. Yeah. But yeah. the point is, those scenes, those scenes, that emotion that, you're, that, the, that the audience is, is feeling and expressing that reminds us of our common humanity, then you've succeeded. And yeah. I think that's what you know we're, what we're talking about here. It's like you can have the most dazzling camera work. Right. If you look at something like a, the films of John Cassavetes, I think is a perfect example. Sometimes, if I mean, look at like a film. I'm sure you've seen a film like Faces. I mean, yeah. there are scenes in Faces, which I think was his first great film. And, uh, you know, it goes on and on. And you look at like the end. There's a ragtag quality that I'm sure if you took it to film school, uh, and they'd say, well, you know, it goes on too long. The camera wanders a little bit or what, but it right. gives that gritty reality that, that, that while it, 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 some people are going to nitpick it, it gets to you and it's something different. And, and that's, that's the kind of thing that works. And that's not to say that you can't have, you know, the dazzling visuals of an Orson Welles or, or Kubrick's, you know, fanatic control. But right. if that's not the only way to, you know, there are many past Nirvana kind of thing. And, and I, and I think George was attracted to, to more of that Cassavetian's ideal. Myself. It, it, exactly. I, I, I agree. I agree that there's an emotional truth there. And um, yeah, but at the same time, you know, we, we have to understand, uh, particularly as directors and cinematographers, is the visual grammar. How are you going to express that? Yeah. And what's so key is that having a, in your toolbox, understanding the subtleties, just as a writer has with punctuation, uh, we have with camera placement, uh, choice of lens, uh, whether we move the camera or not move the camera, or and lighting. You know, we can say so many things. Uh, that's uh, that, but it's all part of a, now interpreting from the written word into a visual grammar. Uh, what's again? I point back to you know what's the point of view here? What's the idea? What's the mood? And what's the emotion here that's going to propel and and move the story forward? And George understood all that. Well, uh, any final comment, or do you want to just rest on that? Um, other than uh, George was a. A dear, dear friend, uh, a remarkable uh, human being, and a 
great influence on my life. Uh, and I would, uh, as a, as that's for me defines a friendship where it's so mutually nourishing. And uh, we just uh, had a, such a wonderful exchange of, uh, I said, the currency of ideas was always paramount in our, in our discussions. Uh, and it was rich. It was a rich friendship. And uh, I hope to uh, carry on our promise to, to get this film produced, The Fool's Errand. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Dayan Georgievich. And uh, over the coming weeks and months, I hope to have other friends and family members of George Dickerson speaking uh, briefly or at length about their experiences. And Dayan, uh, if you, uh, you know, as I said, in the future, if uh, there's any updates on the film and the progress, please let me know. And if you know of anyone else uh, uh, that George, any business associates or friends that might want to speak on his, you know, about him, uh, don't hesitate to contact me. And thank you again. It was a pleasure. Thanks.